But the first two speakers we're going to have talking together, I believe, um, Andrew and uh, uh, John. Um, I'm just going to introduce them uh, and give you a bit of their bio. So Professor Andrew Day is an academic paediatric gastroenterologist based in Christchurch. He has a very strong clinical and research interest in celiac disease as well as other gut disorders. Um, Andrew's ongoing research and activities are supported by Cure Kids. And then we have Dr. John Bishop, who I said is a, as a, a, a consultant paediatric gastroenterologist at the Starship here in Auckland. And his professional interests include celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and cystic fibrosis liver disease. So they're the, the first speakers. And um, they're going to talk about celiac disease and its impact on your family. So non-dietary therapy overview. Thank you, Claire. Um, so thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to talk. So I'm just going to talk about non-dietary therapies. <clears throat> just going to touch on the pathogenesis of celiac disease, the cause, and thinking in terms of um, what we do at the moment, but also touching on what's around the corner. Some of the things I'm going to mention uh, aren't, none of the things that I'm going to mention are things that are available right now. Some of them um, looked very promising but haven't panned out, um, and some of them are still being evaluated. And I'm not going to touch all of the options that are available, but just focus on, just for the time available, on some things. So just to remind us in terms of the cause of celiac disease, the pathogenesis of celiac disease, <coughs> we have the proteins from wheat, barley and rye that we can't break down any further and something triggers them moving through the surface of the gut. As Cameron just mentioned, <clears throat> infections, pregnancy and so on might change the permeability so those guys are able to get through where they're digested, activated by tissue transglutaminase, those little red rectangles, and then presented to the immune system with the immune system contributing to the damage and also leading to the antibodies that we can measure. So that whole pathway is important. <clears throat> and as you know, at the moment, we have a gluten-free diet in terms of the current management for celiac disease. And that's useful but not perfect. And as Cameron just mentioned, sometimes people have non-responsive non or refractory celiac disease. Um, but we're managing the celiac, sorry, the gluten-free diet in a gluten-containing world. There's inadvertent and non-adherent exposure. There might be incomplete healing. And there's other nutritional implications, and Sylvia's going to talk more about that as well. <coughs> and if we just go back to that little cartoon, I've put some red stars, <coughs> and these just emphasise the parts along this pathway that people have looked at or are looking at in terms of trying to interfere with or stop <clears throat> these processes, maybe from stopping them starting, but also to reverse these changes. And I'm just going to, as mentioned, talk about some of them. <clears throat> Before I do, just a comment in terms of clinical trials, so a drug trial, whether it's for a heart condition or for a diuretic for kidneys, are evaluated in terms of preclinical, so often animal studies, and then moving on to phase one, phase two, and phase three studies with key questions as illustrated here in terms of working through and evaluating, is this drug fit for purpose? Is it safe? Is it going to do what we want it to do? And then following approval, then there might be further assessment in terms of comparing one drug to another drug or looking in children as well as in adults and so on. So it's a whole series of pathways. <clears throat> and most of the agents and things that I'm going to mention are working through the first parts of these pathways, so phase one and phase two. So reduction of... Um, gluten or removal of gluten, and there's a number of different mechanisms in terms of how this might happen. Some people have been looking at the ancient grains, einkorn, for example, um, that have a different genetic work, different genetic makeup, and trying to see can we um, change <coughs> the exposure. <coughs> and similarly, genetic modification of wheat, barley, rye, or particularly wheat, in terms of 
so that those proteins are not present and then not able to trigger things. <clears throat> Microbial modification in terms of with ingestion to break down the proteins, masking the activity and digesting the peptides, and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the second two. <clears throat> Enhancing the digestion in the gut, so these peptides that we can't break down, none of us, and that then they become toxic. So we can use various artificial pepsidases or enzymes to break them down, and those names at the bottom, lattiglutinase and Cumamax, are <coughs> two of those things. So <coughs> this guy here has got a, a code ALV003, not quite 007, but... <coughs> So it's got two enzymes together, and it does seem to be very promising. Um, these two components, the green one and the blue one on this little diagram, digest the, that um, immunogenic fragment um, in different segments so that it's no longer immunogenic and no longer toxic and contributing to triggering celiac disease. So these guys work together in that sort of fashion. <coughs> And this is a cartoon from a, um, uh, from a recent publication a couple of years ago in one of the phase two studies evaluating this drug. So in this case, they gave people a gluten-free meal with added gluten um, combined with that and then gave the active agent, the 003, complete, compared to placebo. And they looked to see in the urine whether there were um, glide and peptides or components of the gluten present or not. <clears throat> and on this little graph on the side here, the red bar is those that had the placebo, so they had lots of gluten peptides in their urine, and the blue one at the bottom was those that had had the active agent, and they suggested that this degraded about 95% of the gluten. <clears throat> so promising, <clears throat> but as mentioned earlier, not not there yet in terms of being able to be got from a pharmacy near you. This other guy, <coughs> TAC0062, <coughs> no, sorry, 062, um, and this is using a, um, an enzyme from a bacteria. So this is a soil-based bacteria from Japan, actually, and they um, engineered, um, modified that enzyme to give it even greater specificity. And in summary, it has a hundred times greater activity for glide and what the enzyme did to begin with and degrades almost all of that gliadin. <clears throat> and this is just, again, a publication from a year or two ago. So this is the naturally occurring enzyme in green and then it's modified <clears throat> and so on, so it's even more effective. And in this case, they got a complex meal containing gluten, added that enzyme, got someone to take it, and then aspirated what was happening in the stomach. And they showed 97 to more than 99% of gluten degradation. So this enzyme helps to break down the gluten so that it's not able to then trigger celiac disease. That's the premise of it. <coughs> and again, that's ongoing studies. <coughs> Different approach. This is like a binder or a sponge that binds onto the gluten. BL7010, um, and specifically binds the alpha gliadin, um, and there's very good work in terms of the in terms of animal studies. Oops, and then now that's moved through phase one and phase two, and I understand that's now classified as a food supplement in Europe, <clears throat> but I'm not sure that it's available elsewhere at the moment. Um, AGY, so this is a group of investigators from Canada, from Alberta, um, and their initial study showing this egg yolk derived anti gliadin antibody that again binds onto or stops the gliadin in the gut. Um, and they showed very promising results in their initial study, and they've got a phase two study that's ongoing. <coughs> so, a different way of working tightening the tight junctions. This is the connections between the cells so that things can't get through between the cells. <coughs> and this agent here, larosatide, um, went through a whole series of different evaluations and studies, and it was actually discontinued last year because the studies or the results weren't promising. Um, so this is an example of one of the things that doesn't look like it's going to pan out. But there's other agents, different inhibitors, that may have a role 
in making the cells tighter together so that things don't get through. <coughs> How about inhibiting this enzyme, the TTG, the tissue transglutaminase, different part of the pathway, um, and there's a whole series of different chemicals, agents that are um, that seem to do this well, and the Z1227 um, is one of these, and this was published a couple of years ago, so they, um, a phase two study looking at this agent, and they looked at 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams, and 100 milligrams, so people in each of those sort of different dosing groups, and they showed that the um, there was a reduction in the damage to the duodenum, the small bowel, that was dose dependent, so that damage was even less in the larger dose. And that seemed like it was going to improve symptoms and quality of life in those, in those adults, um, but not definitive results at all, and that program again is ongoing. <coughs> How about modulating the immune response, so even further down the pathway? Um, and this is one agent here called TAC-101. So the TAC stands for Takeda, which is one of the drug companies that's been working very hard in this area. Um, and this agent um, uses nanoparticles to bind some gliadin in a small component. Then it gets through, gets to the spleen, where it um, uh, changes the T-cell responses so that they get tolerance, so you're able to tolerate the gliadin. And again, that's gone through, through phase one and phase two studies. And this is just a little cartoon for, for this as well. So this is the nanoparticles taken into the spleen and then changing the T-cell responses. <coughs> um, and again, this is being ongoing evaluation in terms of does this have a role or not. <coughs> There's a number of other examples that can also interfere with different aspects of the immune response, and you'll see IL-15, interleukin-15, is um, mentioned there a few times in terms of different agents, different companies. So trying to put this all together, this is just a different manifestation of that same sort of cartoon. Each of these little blue boxes on the side that mentions some of the things I've mentioned already, plus some others that I haven't mentioned. Um, but People are attacking this pathway in lots of different um, aspects, lots of different positions in terms of trying to develop ways to manage celiac disease even better than a gluten-free diet. Um, but as mentioned before, none of these agents are available in a chemist near you yet. It's very likely that one or more will be. <coughs> so the future is very promising, lots of different ways of attacking celiac disease. Keep watching the horizon. Um, so two of the um, clinical trial companies, um, drug um, evaluation companies, <coughs> are with us here today. Um, and there's certainly opportunities for you to be involved in this pathway and this um, evaluations in terms of um, being involved in the clinical trials for people with celiac disease to try and help us, or try and help the, the world to understand these things better as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.